Hello and welcome to uh, the London Mackerel where we discuss finance and other stuff and today I'm going to give you the first little lecture which will be a, a more technical introduction to collateralized loan obligations or CLOs that we'll talk about shortly. Living in the litigious environment uh, in which we do it's always good to have some disclaimers the obligatory legal stuff I'm afraid so the first thing to say is that uh, Obviously, no advice is being given, nor solicitation is being made. You need to take your own advice. Um, this is purely an educational video, and it should be seen in that manner, just, to, just as imparting information and not making a solicitation. Uh, you must consult your own professional advisors, of course, when you make any investment. And it's a short video that describes complex instruments, which means that ideas are simplified and the reality may be very different. And then finally, uh, whilst it's given in good faith, of course, of course, I'm not responsible for any errors, and I'm sure there are a few. Anyway, let's go into CLOs, and let's talk about the basic structure of a CLO transaction to start off with. And a CLO transaction essentially addresses the, prob the, the following problem or issue or structure. First of all, CLO stands for Collateralized loan obligation please excuse my terrible handwriting and these are structures that are used to buy a pool of corporate loans and in our example you might want to buy a hundred corporate loans these loans currently pay about LIBOR plus four percent this is in about uh, April let's say May 2017 they pay uh, LIBOR plus four percent LIBOR of course is the London interbank offer rate and it's a floating rate that changes typically every three months but but in some instances you get one month LIBOR that's a rate that changes every month and a uh, longer LIBOR and these are loans issued by companies in uh, the US and in Europe and the key thing about them is is that they are rated, and for those of you who understand ratings, that they are sub-investment grade ratings. So they're typically rated single B or double B, and sometimes even triple C. And so the real issue is this, is that can, can you find someone who is a low-risk investor to invest in this pool of loans? Because a low-risk investor might say, you know, listen, I don't want to take sub-investment grade, single B, double B, and sometimes even triple C risk. <clears throat> On the other hand, you might say uh, someone who wants to really earn a big spread, like say 12 or 13%, an equity type spread, we'll look at that LIBOR plus four. Currently a US LIBOR is about half a percent. So they'll say in total I'm earning four and a half percent. I I don't find LIBOR plus four particularly attractive. And in fact, in Europe, LIBOR is even negative. So your higher risk returns, your higher risk investors simply wouldn't want to invest in this pool of loans. Is there a structure that allows us A, to get in low risk investors? And B, high risk, high return investors? And you would think that there's not, but if you did think that there wasn't, then you'd be wrong because remarkably there is such a structure. And this, of course, is the collateralized loan obligation structure that we'll explain right now. And the idea is as follows, is that a special purpose company is set up typically in, in the Cayman Islands or Delaware for U.S. loans or in Ireland, Luxembourg or the Channel Islands for European loans. And nearly all of these loans are either U.S. or European, and nearly all CLOs are either U.S. CLOs uh, denominated in U.S. dollars or European CLOs denominated in euros. So they're either in euros or in dollars. And this vehicle is set up in, in a tax-neutral jurisdiction. And the idea simply is, is that this vehicle will be funding, will be will be borrowing money and it'll be earning money and it needs to be able to offset its borrowings against its earnings in a very clean way. Uh, with the idea being that the investors who are domiciled all over the world will pay tax in the jurisdictions in which they live. 
So it's set up in a tax neutral jurisdiction, specifically jurisdictions that don't have withholding tax. And what does this company do? Well, it issues a whole lot of liabilities. And this really is the key to the magic because it issues liabilities with a priority of payment. So what it says, first of all, is it says, okay, well, I'm going to raise, and in our example, let's look at the situation here. Just to be clear, we we have got a, we want to buy a hundred different corporate loans. They're $4 million. Let's, let's use the example of a, a US CLO, $4 million each. So that's a portfolio of $400 million. By the way, th these loans, even though they are they are sub investment grade loans, they will be, they are large companies, and they would issue the loan issuance size could be very big. It it, it could be well as small as maybe thirty million dollars, very you know for 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 a certain class of sellers, but they're typically four, five, six hundred million dollars, or sometimes even in excess of a billion dollar issuance, and that's certainly the same in euros, where you it's not unusual to see a billion dollar billion euro loan issuance so they're large issuances but the company is just going to buy small amounts of four million dollars each and in our example we we have a pool of assets which will be 400 million dollars that we need to fund or the company needs to fund and so the first thing it does is it raises 250 million dollars in this example and that 250 million dollars is used to purchase this pool of loans now what will happen is is that the full 400 million dollars of loans will be security for that 250 million dollar loan so the loan is over securitized by 150 million dollars but 400 minus 250 equals 150 it's over securitized and in addition, the first dollar of both principal and interest that's earned will go towards paying this senior tranche. And so typically what happens is the rating agencies will rate the senior tranche AAA, which is the best rating that you can possibly get. It's the lowest risk rating that you can get. It's the kind of rating where a bank or a pension fund or a very low risk investor uh, can invest their investable funds into. And so because it's a low risk investment, it will pay something like LIBOR plus 1%. So the pool's throwing off LIBOR plus 4%, but your most senior tranche will be paying LIBOR plus 1%. And AAA invest, investments are meant to be nearly as safe, at least in theory, as, 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 as government investments. It's meant to be an extremely safe investment. But of course, in this example, we've raised $250 million dollars. We need to raise $400 million, so the company raises another tranche of assets. In this example, $50 million. The $50 million stands behind, it's the second priority, it stands behind uh, the first pay, the triple A's. And so after the triple A's have got paid, the double A's get paid. The first thing to see here is that uh, we've raised $300 million. you've got a pool of $400 million. So your AAA has a hundred million subordination subordination to it, and after the interest on the on the AAA is paid, sorry, the AA has subordination of a hundred million to it, and after the interest on the AAA is paid, then the interest on the AA gets paid, and again because this is a, a low risk investment, it has, or at least certainly in theory, it's a low risk investment. It has a it has a hundred million dollars of subordination and it's getting interest fairly quickly. It gets this double A rating, which is also an extremely good rating. There are very few corporations, for example, that have double A ratings. And it would typically pay something like LIBOR plus two percent because it's a low risk investment. Similarly, we need to raise another well, you can see we're a hundred million dollars short here. We need to raise another hundred million dollars. So we raise another forty million dollars. This stands behind the double A's. It's the third priority piece in this example. And typically in the current environment, that piece would earn LIBOR plus three. And the rating agency would rate that, would rate that piece, I'll rub this out so you can see it, would rate it single A. So your, 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 single, a, your single A has $60 million. You can do the math quite easily of subordination in the pool 
that is it has 300 million dollars above it and it's 40 million dollars so it's got 60 million dollars of, of subordination uh, and it stands behind the double a when interest is paid and when principal is paid but it's still a very low risk piece of collateral and there are very few companies that are a rated as well and this typically in the current market would pay libel plus three percent and you can see, by the way, that there are very few, if any, A-rated companies in the current market that pay as much as LIBOR plus 3%. So it's a reasonable investment for many investors. You now need to raise the other 60 million. And so the, the, the same idea is really applied. There's a fourth pay, a fourth priority piece in our example. This, this is 20 million here. It's got 40 million subordination to it. It stands behind the, the the notes above it, but it's still got 40 million subordination when you do the maths. In our example, they've raised 20 million. And the rating agencies say, well, 40 million, 40 million subordination, plus the 4% that's being thrown off on this 400 million pool, the LIBOR plus four, I should say, uh, you know, means that this note is still pretty secure. And so this note is rated triple B, which is investment grade. In our example and this is a realistic example and, and here is the first thing to to notice uh, we have been able to create a, a note which is rated higher on average than our pool and our pool plays, plays libel plus four but here in this example and 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 rates have tightened a bit in may but 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 this year certainly Triple B's earning libel plus four and a half percent is is are completely reasonable in, in CLOs. So you have a piece which has a better rating and a better rating and pays a higher rate than the portfolio that it's funding. So this now is really part of the um of the CLO magic. And it is also worth saying that, or part of the CLO alchemy perhaps, it's also worth saying, you know, when you look at this and, and maybe some people would be incredulous about it, is to say that CLOs actually to date have performed extremely well and notwithstanding the bad reputation that securitization got during the crisis, the financial crisis, in fact CLOs both in Europe and in the US, the rated notes on CLOs certainly performed very, very well and held up very, very well notwithstanding the bad press for other securitization products. And then finally there's the, uh, the first loss or the last pay, the last priority piece to raise the other 40 million that stands last in the queue. And we'll discuss the motivation and economics of that just in a while. But but let's think about how this whole structure gets sold. So what you have, because, you know, who issues the notes, or rather we, we, the company issues the notes legally, but how do the notes find their way into the market? And for that, you would have a dealer bank, I really should say an arranger bank. An arranger bank. And... You would have heard of all of these banks. So we're talking about Goldman Sachs, Deutsche Bank, Morgan Stanley, Barclays, the large banks, and they would take uh, they would take an upfront fee, typically about one percent, but annualized over the life of these transactions. And in another video, I'll discuss precisely how the life of these transactions work. But the life of these transactions are about five to seven years, um, and uh, you know. And on an annualized basis, the dealer bank earns about 20 basis points, and that's just finance speak for 0.2% of the 400 million. <coughs> Excuse me. And the dealer bank sells these, sells these notes, sells the notes to its client base, and its client base might be uh, banks or, or pension funds all over the world for the triple A and double A and then maybe hedge funds or family offices uh, in various jurisdictions for the for the for the, the the slightly or the riskier for the riskier pieces so the market buys these notes and it's also important to say that these notes are ice and debt they have a number they're tradable they're as generic as possible and they're sold in capital markets worldwide so so this is that's what this that's what the dealer bank does, and the dealer bank also helps structure this that this transaction. The key point, of course, is that we're dealing with corporate loans. Now, the thing about corporate loans is that they can they can be repaid early. A company, after all, can decide to repay its loan at any time. Even though it, the loan typically might be seven years, but a company can repay it after two or three years. 
So the question is, well, what happens if a loan gets repaid early? And also, what happens if a loan just doesn't perform well and it's, it's bought at 100 cents in the dollar and it then trades down to it trades down to 90 or 80 cents in the dollar? These are senior secured loans that they often first pay loans. Oh, I should actually write here, often first pay. Again, in my dreadful handwriting, uh, often first pay. Um, but they can trade down in a distressed market to 90 or 80 cents when the company gets into trouble. And for that, you really need a manager. You need a manager to A, reinvest cash, okay, and B, to, to, to think about what to do if a loan trades down to 80 or 90 cents, whether to sell that loan or whether to hold on to it in the expectation that it, it will recover par. And also, in, in, in you also expect, because you have a diversified pool of these loans, you know, we've, we've got 100 in our example, you also expect some defaults. So the manager has to decide what to do when a loan defaults, um, whether to take equity in lieu of the loan or sell what's left. And that manager is an extremely important role. Typically, the manager gets paid about 50 basis points. Again, finance speak for 0.5%. And then finally, to talk about here, you have a trustee. You need someone to guarantee the integrity of the structure. And the organization that guarantees the integrity of the structure, which is to say, is to make sure, you know, we say that this is a first pay piece of paper. And it's first pay in terms of this, the issuing company's uh, trust deed, perhaps, or what is called its indenture, but essentially it's articles and memoranda. Um, in terms of in terms of its legal docs, it has to pay the AAA first and the AA second and so forth. But someone has to make sure that that happens, and the the person or the organisation that makes sure is a trustee, and it's a, it would be a trustee bank. So the trustee would make sure the cash comes from the pool of assets, and then is paid down what's called the waterfall in the priority of payments. And the trustee banks are, are, again, the normal trustee banks that you would have heard of. Bank of New York has a large trustee bank operation. Uh, Deutsche Bank as well. U.S. Bank. These are these are large banks that run trustee businesses, and they will ensure that everyone is paid as they should be, and they'll take legal liability for that. And they would typically earn about 10 basis points for this, or 0.1%. So now we get to the economics of this first loss piece that we haven't really discussed. And this is this is also a, a strong motivation for CLOs because very often with CLOs, it's the first loss or the residual, the person who earns the residual return that drives the structure. Well, what does that first loss earn? Unsurprisingly, here is the calculation. Let me just tidy things up just very quickly. Maybe I'll leave, maybe I'll leave the 0.1% there. Let's tidy things up a bit. It's not too confusing. And so how do we calculate this 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 first loss? The first loss return? Well, you can see that the portfolio throws off uh, LIBOR plus 4% and is paying liabilities of LIBOR plus a margin in all cases. So on the cost of funds, the LIBOR is pretty much cancelled. And so we can look at the spread above LIBOR, this 4%. And you can see 4% of 400 million is 16 million, unsurprisingly. So the assets throw off 16 million above LIBOR. The AAAs are paying 1% on 250 million. So that's 2.5 million gets paid to the AAAs. Similarly, in our example, the AAAs are paying 2% on 50 million per annum. So each year, about 1 million in our example gets paid to AAAs. The single A's are paying 3% on 40 million, so they earn 1.2 million. The triple B's are getting paid 4.5% above LIBOR on 20 million. If you look at 4.5%, that's 900,000. The Arranger Bank is taking out 0.2% of 400 million, so that, if you do the math, is $800,000 in our example. The trustee is taking out 0.1%, 0.1% of 400 million is 400,000. Just gonna sort of quickly do the math. And then the manager is taking about half a percent 
of 400 million. Wait, no, that's one million clear. Well, 1% of 400 million is clearly 4 million, so half a percent is 2 million. There you go. So net, when we when we say 60 million, 16 million less all the costs, we get 7.2 million above LIBOR. That's LIBOR, this last little bit will earn. And that's the return on the investment. And this is the key thing, assuming assuming that there's no defaults. Obviously, there will be defaults, and we'll talk about that at, at some point. So the equity earns what is commonly called the equity, colloquially called the equity, the residual really earns 7.2 million. 7.2 million, here we go, on 40 million. So the, the residual is earning LIBOR plus 18% in the absence of any losses in this pool. And that is a very good return. So see what we've done here to summarize. Is we've created a structure where you have a triple A investor who's investing in this pool. And also where you've got we've got an investor who wants to take a lot of risk taking the first loss, but earning 18 LIBOR plus 18%. We've also managed to get to invest in this pool. Um, so that's really that's really quite remarkable when you think about it. And uh, Clearly, that 18% will drop each year as losses occur in this pool, as they invariably do. But hopefully for the first loss investor, those losses won't be that severe. The final arrow that popped up was, what is the relationship really between who, who, who are these residual investors? And as I said, they, they, they might be hedge funds. But very often as well, the manager, the manager and some CLOs, um, some class of CLOs, typically middle market CLOs for, for, for slightly uh, riskier sub-investment grade debt, or for riskier sub-investment grade debt, is also the first loss investor because the manager is so close to this pool and is managing this pool on a day-to-day -day basis. Clearly, sometimes the manager is happy to put uh, his or her own money and or the company's own money into the first loss. And indeed, with new regulations, both in Europe and in the US now, uh, managers have to put uh, money in, into these transactions under retention rules. So does that money typically goes into the money that they put into the structure would, would typically go into the uh, into the first loss piece. And I think as an introductory video on, on the mechanics of how the returns are calculated and the various costs, I'll, uh, I'll stop there. Thank you.